Fine feathers make fine birds for them as can see no farther, cried Parsons contemptuously, and turning one of his threatening scowls upon the old man. But wait a bit, good man Goose, and you'll find out perhaps all as not is glitter, all as all is not gold as glitters. Poor little fella, exclaimed the farmer on meeting the superintendent's ill-omened eye. I wish with all my heart, master, that nobody cared for more, for, no more for your ugly looks than I do. Dame Pritchard, said Parsons, without appearing to hear him, let the boy and me have a bit of supper, do you hear? In spite of his fine clothes, however, which were but a gift of charity, the boy is neither better nor worse than any one of our factory children. I would not have thought it, said the old man. Old, I would have not have. I would not have thought it, said the old man, apparently satisfied, and turning to his mug. No, I dare say," retorted Parsons with a sneer. "Such chaps as you seldom finds out what's what or who's who before they are told." From this moment, no further interaction interest was expressed about little Michael. He was a factory boy, and what good was there in asking any further questions? So a thick slice of bread and a scrape of bacon were set before him, and as soon as the more elaborate supper of Mr. Parsons was concluded, he with great affability, took the little fellow by the hand and preceded by Dame Richard, Pritchard and a candle, conducted him to a pallet bed in the same chamber as his own. For the first moment after he was left alone with the boy, the superintendent felt a strong inclination to make him pay for the affronts he had been the cause of his receiving below. But the same wisdom which had cut short his indignation there checked him now, and having locked the chamber door and given Michael a stimulating kick, to un hasten his undressing, he carefully packed in a bundle the Dowling Lodge suit which he took off, leaving in its place beside the bed the result of his hasty shoppings, shoppings at Ashley. When roused from his slumbers at daybreak the following morning, Michael found these new garments ready for him, and for a moment his heart sank at the change, for though new, they were of very lowest kind, and formed as strong a contrast as well possible with the dress he had laid aside on preparing for his night's rest. But the human mind will often show symptoms of philosophy, even at ten years old, which truth was made evident by the manner in which the young apprentice invested himself in his new suit, cheering his spirit as he did so with the recollection that a person going to be bound to a trade like that of a stocking weaver would look, would look very ridiculous in such a dress as had been just taken away from him. Early as it was, Miss Pritchard was ready in the kitchen with a pot of hot tea for Mr. Parsons. Michael receiving received a fit, fitting hunch of bread, the covered cart was brought up to the door, and the ill-matched pair set off again upon their journey. It might seem paradoxically to, paradoxical to say that the temper of Mr. Parsons was irritated by the patient, unsuspicious, and submissive demeanor of his helpless charge, yet such, nevertheless, was the fact. It was many years since the bones of Mr. Parsons had been exposed to any conveyances more rough and rude than Sir Matthew's jockey cart, which was constructed with such with excellent and efficient springs. The moment, therefore, of the covered vehicle which had brought his aching joints to the crooked billet on Ridgetop Moor was equally unwanted and disagreeable. And now that the peaceable demeanor of his little companion had convinced him that it was altogether unnecessary, he felt ready to twist his neck round as an atonement for all he had endured. Ere they had advanced a mile further, however, his spirit found a species of consolation that was perfectly congenial to it. The drear, dark desert that spread before them, dimly visible as far as the eye could reach through the chilling mist of the morning, was just as just out such a region as his heart uh, desired for the dwelling of the young plague who had caused him so jolting a journey and here, too, the covering of the rough machine was far from unwelcome, so that Mr. Parsons, as he drove slowly and cautiously onward amidst the deep ruts and rumbling stones, looked out upon the bleak desolation of the scene with a feeling that almost approached to complacency. At length the moor was passed, and for a few miles their joints enjoyed the luxury of a turnpike road. The country, too, seemed softening in a, into a species of wild beauty that might, in some degree, degree atone for its bleakness, but ere this had lasted more than a couple of hours, the horse's head was again turned aside from the main road, and by a steep and very rough descent, 
they gradually approach the level of a stream running through so very narrow a valley as in many places to afford barely space enough for the road between the brook and the precipitating heights which shut it in on reaching this level the road which for the last quarter of a mile had seemed to be leading them into the little river itself turned abruptly and by an angle so acute following the indented curve of the lofty hill that they speedily appeared to be shut in on all sides by the towering hills that suddenly, as if by magic, reared themselves in every direction round. It is hardly possible to conceive a spot more effectually hidden from the eyes of all man than this singular valley. Hundreds may pass their lives within a few miles of it without having the least idea that such a spot exists, for, from the form of the hills it so happens, that it is possible to wander for hours over their summits without discovering it one undulation rising beyond another, so as to blend together beneath the eye, leaving no opening by which this strip of water level in their very center can be discerned. For about another half mile, the narrow cart road runs beside the stream without encountering any single object except its lofty barrier and the brook itself, more remarkable than here and there a reed of higher growth than common or a plant of foxglove that by its gay blossom seems to mock the desolate sadness of the spot another turn however still following the wavy curvings of the mountain's base for mountain there's it there it seems to be opens another view and one that speaks to many senses at once the difference between the melancholy cause melancholy caused by nature and that produced by the work of man a wide spreading cotton factory here rears its unsightly form and at one glance makes the happy wanderer whose foot is free to turn which way he will feel how precious is the power of retracing his steps back again along the beguiling path that has led him to it this was a joy for which our little michael sighed in vain on jogged on jogged the cart and near it came at every jolt to the object which he most hated to look upon but then came the also the cheering thought that he was no longer a mere factory boy, but about to become an apprentice to be a good and profitable trade, in which, hereafter, he might expect to get money enough for himself, for his mother, and Teddy, too. Nevertheless, he certainly did wish, at the very bottom of his heart, that the stocking-weaving business was not carried on in a building so very like a cotton factory. But though Michael saw this hated cotton factory, he as yet saw but a small portion of the horrors which belonged to the spot he had reached. His position in the vehicle made it impossible for him to look round and perceive how completely all the acts that might be committed in that deep valley were hidden from the eye of every human being but those engaged in them. Neither could he recognize in the dismal buildings detached, yet connected both with the manager's house and the factory, the prison prentice house which served as home to hundreds of little aching hearts each one endowed by nature with light spirits merry thoughts and fond affections but all of whom rose to their daily toil under circumstances which rendered enjoyment of any kind both morally and physically impossible the graduations by which all the misery that awaited him was dis disclosed were however neither lingering nor uncertain the cart stopped, Parsons got out, and then calling forward his companion, seized him roughly by the arm and swung him through the door, which opened to receive them. So, this is the chap you are going to bestow upon us, is it, Mr. Parsons? said a fellow whose aspect must have withered the hope in the gayest spirits that youth and joy ever produced between them. Has he nimble fingers? He can move them quick enough when he's got a mind for it, replied Parsons, but you must not spare the strap, I can tell you. For a more obstinate, hard-skinned little devil never crossed the threshold of a factory. Never mind, Mr. Parsons. We know how to manage all those matters as you may depend upon it. We possess many advantages over you, sir. No parents here, you know, to come bothering us about bones and bruises. Here they all count at what they are worth, and no more. Children is plenty, Miss Parsons, and that's about the best thing we have got in our favor, for it can't be denied, but we all of us at times finds that we have managed to complete more work than tis easy to dispose of. No doubt of that, Mr. Woodcombe, but you had better hand off the boy, if you please, and then we'll settle our little matter of business, and I'll be off. Your roads are none of the best, sir, and I must make, make my way back to Crook Billet tonight. 
Not till you have had a drop and a bit of bit a drop a bit and a drop with us, Mr. Parsons. They are at supper in the prentice house now, and our young master shall be handed in at once. So saying, the scowling manager opened a door in the farthest corner of the room, and made Michael a sign that he was to pass through it. The child obeyed, but he trembled in every joint. Feelings of deeper terror than had ever reached his heart before were creeping over him. His lips moved not, but his very soul seemed to whisper within him, Mother! Mother! Yet at that moment the unhappy boy knew not what was before him. The influence under which he cowered thus was like that produced by the leaden dimness of a coming storm upon the birds who droop their pinions and seem ready to fall to the earth even before a single hailstone has touched them. A long, low passage led to another door, which was again opened by the condescending hand of Mr. Woodcombe. Through this he thrust the poor, he thrust the poor Michael, and having either by a word or a sign made known to the governor of the Prentice House that he had brought an accession to his wretched crew, he retired, closing the door behind him. Michael heard the door close, and looked up. The room he was in was so long as almost appeared like a gallery and from one end to the other of it in a narrow deal board stretched out, having room for about two hundred to sit down at once. The whole of this table was now occupied by a portion of the apprentice children, both boys and girls belonging to Deep Valley Mill, and their appearance might have wrung the heart of any being who looked, at, looked upon them, however blessedly wide his own destiny might lead him from the melancholy troop. But to Michael the spectacle was appalling, and, young as he was, he seemed to feel that the filthy, half-starved wretches before him were so many ghostly representations of what he was himself to be. A sickness like that of death came over him, and he would have given a limb only for freedom to stretch himself down upon the floor and see no more. But the master of the ceremonies at this feast of misery bore a huge horsewhip in his hand, without in which, indeed, it is said, he seldom appeared on the premises, and with it an eye that seemed to have the power of quelling with a single glance the will of every little wretch it looked upon. The place that Michael was to take at the board was indicated to him, and he sat down. The food placed before him consisted of a small bowl of what was denominated stir pudding, a sort of miserable water porridge, and a lumpy lump of oaken cake of a flavor so sour and musty that the little fellow, though never accustomed till the fatal patronage of Sir Matthew fell upon him to any vivians more dainty than dry bread could not at, could not at this first essay persuade himself to eat it the wife of the governor of prentice house a help meet for him in every way chanced to have her eye upon the stranger child as he pushed the morsel from him and the smile that relaxed her features might have told him something had he chanced to see and understand it respecting the excellent chance that there was of his having a better apprentice in in future appetite in future a girl nearly of his own age sat on one side, and a boy considerably older on the other, the first who had as much of, of beauty as it was perhaps possible for any human being to have after six months' residence in Deep Valley Mill, looked up into his face with a pair of large blue eyes that spoke unbound pity, and he heard a soft little voice whisper, Poor boy! while his lanky neighbor on the other side made prize of, a, of the rejected food, venturing to say aloud, Anyhow, it is too good to be wasted. The wretched meal did not last long, and for a few minutes after it was ended, the governor and his wife disappeared. During this interval, those who had strength and inclination moved about the room as they listed, but as but by far the greater number were already dropping to sleep after a day of protracted labor, during which they had followed the ceaseless movements of the machinery for above fifteen hours. Among the former was the hungry lad who had appropriated the oat cake of Michael, and no sooner were the eye of the master and mistress removed than he turned to the newcomer, and a tone that seemed to hover between good humor and ridicule said, So, you could not find a stomach for your supper, my man? I did not want any supper, replied Michael, dolefully. You didn't want it, did you? That speaks better for the living as you have left. As then I can... You didn't want it, didn't you? You, did, you didn't want it, didn't you? That speaks better for the living as you have left than, can I, than I can speak of that as you'll find, returned his new acquaintance. Don't say nothing to nobody, and tomorrow morning, after the lash, lash have sounded through the room to wake us all, just you start up and jump into your clothes, and when, you, when we goes to pump, 
I'll show you where we get our tits bits from. Michael was in the act of nodding assent to this proposal when the woman, who five minutes before had left the room, returned to it by a very summary process caused the ragged, weary, prayerless, hopeless multitude to crawl and clamber, half sleeping and half waking to their filthy beds. They were divided by fifties in a room, but notwithstanding the number and a little space in which they had to stow themselves, the stillness of heavy sleep pervaded every chamber, ere the miserable little inmates had been five minutes enclosed within the walls. Poor Michael lay as motionless as the rest, but he was not sleeping. Disappointment, fearful forebodings, and excessive nausea all conspired to banish this only blessing that an apprentice factory child can know. He'd already labored, poor fellow, for nearly half his little life, and that under the most hard and unrelenting masters, but till now he had never known how very wretched his young thoughts could make him. His mother's fond caress and his brother's fervent love had, in spite of toil and sometimes in spite of hunger, cheered and comforted the last moments of every day. The rude bed also, on which the brothers lay, was too clean, notwithstanding all the difficulties of keeping it so, to be tainted with a loathsome smell of oil or sundry other abominations which render the place which he now lay almost intolerable. Yet to this den, far, far away from the only creatures who loved and cherished him, he was come by his own consent, his own expressed desire. The thought was almost too bitter to bear, and the bundle of straw that served him for a pillow received for the first hour of the night a ceaseless flood of tears. It was, as his young companion predicted, by the sound of a flourishing whip that he was awakened on the following morning. In an instant he was on his feet, and in a minute or two more sufficed to invest him in his clothes. This speed, however, was the effect of terror, for he remembered not the invitation of, prece of the preceding evening. But hardly had he finished the operation of dressing, when Charlie Ford, the boy who gave it, was by his side and giving him a silent hint by a wink to the left eye and a movement of the right elbow that he might follow him, turned away and ran down the stairs. Michael did so too, and presently found himself with a multitude of others in a small paved court, on one side of which was a pump, to whose spout every child came in succession to perform by very necess necessary, but, but from lack of soap, very imperfect act of abulation. Neglecting to watch his turn for this, and not permitting Michael to do so either, Charles Charles Ford made his way to a door that opened upon another part of the premises, and pushing it open, disclosed to the eyes of Michael a loathsome and fearful spectacle. Seven or eight boys had already made their way up, made their way to a sort of rude farmyard upon which the door, which this door opened. One and all of them who were intent upon pur purloining from a filthy trough just replenished for the morning meal of two stout hogs, a variety of morsels which, as Michael's new acquaintance assured him, were dainty eating for the starving prentices of Deep Valley Mill. Make haste, young'un, cried Charles good-naturedly, or they won't leave a turnip pair pairing for us. And on he rushed to the scuffle, leaving Michael gazing with disgust and horror at the contest between the fierce snouts of the angry pigs and the active fingers of the wretched crew who contested with them for the, for the awful thus cast forth. Michael Armstrong was a child of deep feeling, and it was perhaps lucky for him that the burning sense of shame and degradation which pervaded every nerve of his little frame as he looked upon this revolting spectacle come upon him while yet too young for any notion of resistance to suggest itself. He felt faint, sick, and broken-hearted, but no worm that ever was crushed to atoms by the foot of an elephant dreamed less of vengeance than did poor Michael. As the horrid thought came over him that he was going to abide in a place where little boys were treated with less care and tenderness than pigs.